The task of reorienting economic policy to align better with the goals of preventing violent conflict will require determined and sustained efforts. It's something we should go into appreciating how difficult the task is with our eyes open. What I'd like to do now is think with you a bit about some of the dilemmas that are often encountered in peace building and some of the obstacles to reorienting economic policy towards that end. In terms of dilemmas, there are four in particular that I'd like to briefly touch base on. First, the humanitarian dilemma. The potential negative effects of humanitarian aid on vulnerable populations are first of all that that aid will be taxed, politically taxed. So to give an example, during the Cambodian War, when the Khmer Rouge had been pushed out of the center of the country and was located on the fringes and operating from border refugee camps on the Thailand side of the border, the UN and other agencies delivered food aid to the refugees in those camps. But the way it worked was that they basically dropped off the aid at the gates and left its distribution to those who controlled the camps, who were the Khmer Rouge. That reliance upon one of the warring parties, a party with a very bloody record, in order to distribute the aid, in certain ways strengthened uh, the KR, the Khmer Rouge, giving them uh, not only political leverage vis-a-vis -vis the people in the camps, but also giving them direct resources that they could use to help perpetuate the conflict, literally feeding their troops. Another example would be in Goma in the wake of the Rwandan genocide in 1994, when the genocidaires, the people responsible for the genocide, fled Rwanda into what was then Zaire and now is the Democratic Republic of Congo, many refugees came with them, fleeing the conflict, fearful of retributions. The international agencies, including non-governmental organizations, arrived on the scene to try to relieve the terrible suffering that was going on in those camps. But once again, the camps were controlled by the party that had been responsible for the Rwandan genocide. The provision of assistance via those parties to the conflict meant that while on the one hand you were relieving immediate suffering, which was intense indeed, on the other hand you were arguably strengthening the hand of the genocidaires and bolstering their ability to fight another day. This tension between the goals of relieving immediate suffering and uh, preventing the resumption of conflict or continuation of conflict was a very, very difficult dilemma. And different agencies, different uh, NGOs came to different conclusions as to what to do. Some stayed and kept providing aid regardless. Others decided to pull out fearing that they would be seen as being and indeed be complicit in what would ultimately turn out to be the perpetuation of the conflict. I can't tell you what's the right answer to that dilemma, but I can tell you that it's a common one and one that we need to face and face squarely. A second way in which humanitarian relief can help to perpetuate conflict is through what's called fungibility. Fungibility means you give money for one purpose and that frees up resources that otherwise would have been used for that purpose to be used for something else. In the case of humanitarian aid, the provision of food, medical supplies, water, shelter, and so on, things that meet basic humanitarian needs, also frees up the need of warring combatants to fund those things themselves, thus freeing their resources for uh, arms and uh, other ways of actually engaging in the conflict. So even though the aid is given in one form, the net result could be, at least in part, something quite different. A third way in which sometimes humanitarian aid is seen as contributing 
to the perpetuation of a conflict is that it provides for the international actors, for the international community, as it's often called, a veneer of engagement, a, a, a patina of doing something about the problem at the same time that that international community is failing to engage with the deeper issues behind the conflict. And finally, humanitarian aid can in some cases, these are particularly dreadful cases, serve in effect as bait. It can provide an illusion of safety so that uh, starving people, uh, displaced people, uh, desperate people come to a center where they can receive humanitarian aid and then they become targets for warring parties once they're assembled there. Something that again happened in Eastern Congo in the wake of the Rwandan genocide. How does one deal with these humanitarian issues? I'm not here to tell you that there's any easy solution because there's not. But one thing that one can attempt to do is think about what smart aid would mean in this context. Donors have a choice as to what to provide, how much to provide, to whom to provide it, and with what conditions attached. And in the face of trade-offs like these, an intuitively sensible strategy is to weigh the good against the harm and try to choose the best or at least least bad alternative. This approach, kind of reminiscent of cost-benefit analysis, becomes difficult, however, when multiple criteria are really involved in weighing what's better and what's worse. For example, protecting lives versus advancing human rights versus advancing justice. These are not easy trade-offs to make, but that doesn't mean that they don't have to be faced and made. And of course, making them is further complicated by incomplete information and imperfect foresight. One of the ways in which this problem is sometimes dealt with is through what are called humanitarian exemptions where aid that would normally come with strings attached is given without strings when that aid is relieving immediate human suffering. Rather than pursuing optimal smart aid decisions, trying to weigh costs and benefits and come up with the best strategy, a good case can be made for this second best approach of simply exempting humanitarian aid from conditionalities altogether and going ahead and providing it and using other means to address the longer term problems. That is, one can apply the smart aid approach to various types of assistance, reconstruction assistance, development assistance, weighing up all the costs and benefits as best one can, but not to humanitarian assistance. In the case of humanitarian assistance, one exempts it and goes ahead and just prioritizes the one goal of relieving human suffering here and now. But that poses another problem, which is how does one draw the line between what qualifies as humanitarian assistance and what does not? This isn't as simple a matter as it may seem at first glance. Food and medicine are clearly humanitarian when they are relieving civilian suffering, but not when they go to combatants. But again, the fact that the decisions here are difficult in drawing the line around a humanitarian exemption, for example, in defining humanitarian aid, does not mean that these decisions can be avoided. The second dilemma is what I'm calling the corruption dilemma. In the short run, allowing a certain amount of what is euphemistically called leakage, some of the external resources being made available to pass into private hands, into private bank accounts, sometimes bank accounts sequestered abroad. And indeed, in development assistance for a long time, a certain amount of leakage has been regarded as tolerable. Sometimes people would say 10%, 15%. Sometimes the percentages were much higher, particularly during the Cold War, when as we talked about before, donors tended to look the other way as long as the recipients of the largesse were on the so-called right side in that superpower conflict. But the problem with allowing such corruption in the short term is that over the long term, it corrodes not only the efficiency 
of relief, recovery, and reconstruction operations, but it also corrodes the legitimacy of the institutions engaged in those tasks, including the legitimacy of the state itself. So in thinking about that trade-off, it's important to disaggregate it and to distinguish between different situations and different parties, and to ask corruption by whom and corruption enabled by whom. There's a distinction, for example, between petty corruption and grand corruption, often made in the literature. Petty corruption refers to little payments made to lower level officials, bribes to traffic policemen, for example, that um, while annoying, become really part of daily routines incorporated in life and indeed part of the way of paying uh, government servants who don't receive enough through their official salaries to get by. Not a nice thing, not a happy thing, not a desirable thing, but in the circumstances perhaps tolerable, at least in the interim. On the other hand, there's grand corruption, and this refers to corruption not by ordinary civil servants at the bottom of the government pyramid, but rather to the rulers at the very top of that pyramid, to presidents, generals, and their families and their associates, who manipulate their access to the levers of power to benefit themselves, as well as to achieve whatever other political aims they wish to pursue. Grand corruption is a much bigger problem in terms of corroding the legitimacy of the state and undermining the efficacy of development and peace building operations. And yet it too is often tolerated by donors, by bilateral as well as multilateral aid institutions and by the governments behind them as part of the cost of doing business. But their willingness to tolerate that comes at a considerable long-term cost. In addition to who is uh, on the receiving end of corrupt payments, there's also the question lurking behind that of who is enabling them. And very often, especially in the case of grand corruption, what we're talking about are networks, transnational networks of enablers, bribers, bagmen, bankers, and others who assist the corruption at the highest levels of a society, not only in illicitly acquiring wealth, but also in sequestering it abroad. My own view is that that process of enabling corruption, as Mobutu once said, it takes two to corrupt, the corrupter and the corrupted. To be the corrupter in that situation, to be the enabler, to be the bagman, to be the ones who provide the money with a wink and a nod and turn the other way as part of it is sliced off and shipped abroad. That is a form of complicity that I believe we should do everything we can to avoid, to discourage. It ought to be policy not to encourage corruption, even if in some cases it becomes necessary to tolerate some of it. Post-conflict debts, debts owed by the governments in countries that are optimistically described as post-conflict, more accurately described as embarked on a fragile war to peace transition. One of the central questions is whether repaying those debts should be a priority for the post-conflict government. Often these debts are difficult or impossible to service, that is to say, to pay interest upon, let alone to repay without diverting scarce resources from other really pressing needs in terms of human welfare and in terms of consolidating the peace and implementing the peace accords when that's the way the war ended. Often, in addition, these debts, which were incurred in the past, before and during the conflict, are of questionable legitimacy on both ethical and legal grounds. Yet default, refusal to keep servicing these debts, can lead to the withholding of new credit, which can be needed at this particular time. It can lead to sanctions of various types. Uh, it can lead to asset seizures, 
For these reasons, defaulting on debts is an option that very few governments have proven willing to pursue. After a war, for example, if a country has been unable to pay its debts, to service its debts, uh, if even the allocation of those debts was uncertain in a case where the country was fragmenting, like in the former Yugoslavia, the fact that the new government is in arrears in its debts to, let's say, the International Monetary Fund means that the International Monetary Fund cannot provide any balance of payments assistance or budgetary support to that government until those debts are cleared. But clearing those debts requires resources that the government just doesn't have. That dilemma, by the way, is exactly what happened in Bosnia at the end of the war that led to the breakup of Yugoslavia. The typical response to this problem can be described as muddling through. There's some combination of rescheduling, bridge loans, and write-offs. An example of a bridge loan would be that the way that Bosnia was able to clear its arrears with the IMF was through a short-term loan from the Dutch government, which was used to clear the IMF debt, and then the IMF provided loans, and over time, Bosnia was uh, meant to uh, repay the loan to the Dutch. These muddling through arrangements, while alleviating the short-term problem, leave the country often with a substantial, albeit sometimes somewhat reduced, burden of debt. An alternative strategy, one that's often discussed but very rarely invoked, is selective repudiation of past debts based on the doctrine in international law called odious debt. The notion of odious debt and its place in international law can be traced back to the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898. In the course of that war, the U.S. acquired control of various Spanish possessions, among them Cuba in the Caribbean. And with control of Cuba came the question of control or responsibility for the debt that the Cuban government, under Spanish rule, had incurred to creditors, particularly European creditors, in the run-up to the war. The attitude taken by the U.S. peace negotiators who went to Paris was that these debts that had been incurred prior to the war by the Cuban government were not legitimate debts and that the new government, which was an American colonial government, would have and accept no responsibility for their repayment. And in making that argument, the U.S. commissioners cited three basic criteria that over the years became more or less the defining criteria for the doctrine in international law. The first of these criteria was that the debts, the money that was borrowed, did not benefit the people of Cuba. On the contrary, maybe the money helped to support a regime which was oppressing them. Secondly, that that debt was contracted without the consent of the people. They had no say in borrowing this money. It was borrowed by a government uh, in their name. And the third condition was that the creditors, the people providing those loans, knew or should have known that this was the case. They should have known that the debts were not benefiting the people and were being contracted without their consent. That set of situations was by no means unique to Cuba in 1898. It indeed has been seen again and again and again. And so, in years since, countries have from time to time considered the idea of invoking the doctrine of odious debts as a way to resolve the debt legacy dilemma. For example, in 2003, in Iraq, in the wake of that war, really what turns out to be closer to the beginning of the war, the new regime considered invoking the doctrine of odious debt, and U.S. policymakers, who were very influential, of course, at that time, also considered invoking it. They decided in the end not to do so. However, maybe the fact that this was a real possibility and on the table helped secure a very big write-off 
or what is sometimes called in the parlance of these credit markets, a haircut on the pre-existing debt from the Saddam Hussein regime. About 80% of that debt was simply written off. So the doctrine of odious debt can be a tool that is used to address this um, debt legacy dilemma. I think for that to happen, however, the onus needs to be in large part upon the creditor institutions to recognize and accept the legitimacy of selective defaults on debt based on the doctrine of odious debt. A country in a post-conflict uh, or for that matter post-dictatorship situation could say, and I believe should be able to say, look, we're an honorable country. We will certainly, uh, to the best of our ability, continue to honor and service all debts that were contracted for the benefit of the people, with the consent of the people. However, we know, and you the creditors know, that many of the debts that have been passed along from that earlier regime were not legitimate then I'm afraid, instead of trying to get the money back from us, go look in the foreign bank accounts of the Marcoses or the Mobutus or the Abachas or whoever the previous regime may have been and see if you can recover your money there because we don't have it and we're not going to pay you back. That would be selective repudiation based on the doctrine of odious debt. I believe that's an important tool that can and should be part of the international legal arsenal for dealing with these debt legacy dilemmas. But again, the creditors have to show a willingness to accept responsibility for their own actions in the past rather than just sloughing it off and putting all the responsibility on successor governments. Lastly, the partition dilemma. Here again, we see a trade-off expediency of the moment versus long-term stability and durability of peace. In the wake of a civil war, particularly where that war has a territorial dimension, different regions, linguistic groups, religious groups, and ethnic groups are at war with each other tempting way to stop the shooting is to come up with a plan for partition where you get this part of the territory, you get this part of the territory, now you've got your own government, your own territory, just go about doing your business and let's stop shooting each other. And as a short run solution, that is often one that's adopted. That's the way the war ended in Yugoslavia, for example. That's the basis of the so-called two-state solution idea in Israel and Palestine. Separate the parties, give them their own independent states, and let them live as peacefully coexisting neighbors. In the short run, one can see the attractions of that, and one can see how it can be couched as a case of self-determination, which is a noble goal. However, there is, again, a potential long-run cost of adopting that solution. By segregating the warring parties into two separate groups, giving them each their own political entities, you are in effect selecting against anybody, any political leaders on either side of that divide who are strongly in favor of reconciliation and peaceful coexistence with the other. And instead, you are setting in motion political dynamics which all too often lead to the emergence of political leaders who manage to mobilize support and hold on to power by demonizing their erstwhile enemies and playing up the threat from the neighboring country which used to be part of the same country, used to be real neighbors, not just a neighboring country. Instead of peaceful coexistence, instead of 
everybody living happily side by side. You have a recipe for perpetual tension, perpetual conflict, and ultimately, in some cases, as we are now seeing unimaginable human cost, the resumption of war in Israel and the Palestinian territories. As I speak these words, the human suffering going on in Gaza is one of the great tragedies of, of our time. And that is, one could argue, part of the long-run cost of the short-run expediency that was behind the two-state solution embraced in the Oslo Accords 30 years ago. I don't want to say that this is an easy dilemma to solve. The case for partition can be very strong indeed. And if there is to be a partition, one of the very important things that follows from that is that in the wake of the partition, when you have these separate political entities, states or proto-states, if those states are heavily uh, dependent upon external assistance, which is often the case in the wake of a war, it should not be a blank check. It should not be money that comes in as if the conflict is all over and now we can merrily get on with the tasks of re reconstruction and development. Because the risk is there that that conflict will be festering below the surface and will erupt again. And unconditional assistance to governments, regardless of their demagoguery, regardless of the extent to which they demonize each other, regardless of the extent to which they prepare for and execute uh, violent actions against their enemy, that support, again, helps to enable the conflict in a way that, in my view, is unconscionable. Dilemmas very often involve short-run versus long-run trade-offs, which are a tough thing for anybody, let alone for policymakers dealing with issues of war and peace. These problems don't lend themselves to easy solutions, and they don't lend themselves to simple cost-benefit analysis of the type with which economists are familiar. Not only because you have these issues of short run versus long run, which raises the, the questions of what the discount rate is, as economists call it, how, how you value future costs against present benefits, for example, but also you have multiple criteria by which good and bad, better and worse outcomes can and should be judged. Different criteria can lead to different orderings of what's better and what's worse. And choosing across those different criteria involves what sometimes is called multi-criteria decision analysis. It's not something that economists are necessarily all that adept at. But it doesn't mean that the solution is just to pretend that none of these problems exist, that none of these other criteria matter, that all we need to do, for example, is concentrate on efficiency at the micro level in cost-benefit analysis and project appraisal and concentrate on growth in the national income at the macro level, which are the traditional preoccupations of economists in general, including development economists. Instead, I think we need to be aware that there are many criteria, there are many uncertainties, there are trade-offs among criteria and between the short run and the long run. And in making those trade-offs, we need to bear in mind the imperatives of preventing conflict and building peaceful, durable societies. To ignore those problems, again, is, I think, an irresponsible neglect of what we really must do if we're going to be involved at all in these situations. It's not up to economists to resolve all these dilemmas, but it is up to them to recognize that they exist rather than pretending that they don't.